Hello, BookTube. All right, I have a bit of a story to tell you. <laughs> You're going to know that already. I have my hand in a number of different pots, and one of those is uh, Book Trek 2021. That is an event I'm doing with a bunch of other BookTubers where we're reading Star Trek fiction for the rest of 2021. Started with the original series, went to Next Generation, then Deep Space Nine, now Voyager, and then Enterprise. And when I was reading Star Trek Voyager, I, or Deep Space Nine, last month, I was encountering one bad book after another, and then really bad books, and then finally I'd had enough. I broke. Deep Space Nine broke me. And so for the last week, ten days, something like that, I have started out my videos about Deep Space Nine, talking a little about Deep Space Nine, and then I have read you excerpts from totally other stuff, stuff that has nothing to do with Star Trek. Uh, it was a kind of psychotic break. It was also a bit of a joke. I had a blast, and a lot of you had a blast as well. A lot of you emailed me and said, of all the things you could have done that would have surprised me for my evening listening to you, this was the best surprise of all. Please continue. Of course, that was the, that was the part that was the part that always makes me think: Is it wise to, for me to share my email with all these people? Is that all of those emails that said that ended with "Please continue"? And the closer we got to the end of uh, October, the more that struck a note of people saying, "Okay, well, Deep Space Nine is ending, and we already know you love Star Trek Voyager, which you've often referred to as Catherine Hepburn goes to space." Uh, so it's unlikely that Star Trek Voyager will be cursed in the way that Star Trek Deep Space Nine was. But that doesn't mean you're going to stop reading us excerpts, does it? <laughs> I heard that from like dozens of people, maybe even a hundred people, saying, that doesn't mean you're going to stop reading us excerpts, does it? Uh, to which I say, listen. <laughs> listen, you people. I can't read to you five hours a day. <laughs> I can't read to you five hours a day. However, <laughs> we, in addition to uh, Book Trek 2021, which is ongoing, November is also the beginning of nonfiction November. One of the biggest and oldest booktube events, a beloved booktube event created by Olive at a book Olive, uh, and run every year by her. It gets bigger every year. It has all sorts of social media bells and whistles. Now it's all over booktube. You'll see, I'm sure you've seen in your feeds. Tons and tons of people making videos about the books they're going to read for nonfiction November. And I made one myself. A little bit difficult for me to do. I, I'm going to read a lot of books in November, and a lot of them are going to be nonfiction. Uh, but one of the ones I started off with uh, was my friend Deb. Uh, my, my friend Deb emailed me and said, what should I start with for November? What nonfiction should I start with? And I said, well, I don't know what nonfiction you have. You know, you should send me a... a an inventory, and she wrote back and said, well, it doesn't matter. I'm looking at my shelves, and I know already what book you're going to pick. You've been telling me to read it for 30 years, so I'm going to pick that. And it was a great pick. And so I thought I would talk about that a little, just as a side note. I know I've been mentioning on this channel that I've have, I have a cavalcade of guests coming here all of a sudden. I'm popular. That doesn't usually happen when you smell like I do and don't wear pants. <laughs> but nevertheless, just by sheer weird coincidence, I have a cavalcade of guests coming in over the span of two weeks. And I've mentioned that a few times on this channel, and I have received many, many emails. Again, the wisdom of leaving my email address. I've received many, many emails saying, well, you know, it's great that you're having guests come over, especially people you haven't seen in a while, but the guest we want to see is Deb. Where is Deb? I know. I know. I'm trying to arrange another Zoom call with her for a Manatee Monday. I'm hoping that it happens. It's a little difficult to get her to do anything. I know this a lot better than the rest of you do, but I'm going to keep trying. But she picked a book. And when I first, she was emailing me, and I thought, okay, well, God knows what you picked. But she picked a great book. So I cheered her, and I want to show you it. It's this. We've seen it on this channel before. This is Louise Haltharp's biography of Isabella Stewart Gardner, the pint-sized, extremely annoying uh, Boston socialite who created Fenway Court and put her name on Boston, what I consider to be Boston's I don't know if you can hear that horn. Every once in a while, someone on the street will indulge in a Hollywood-style horn honk, where they won't just honk because they're annoyed. They'll then keep honking directly behind the car because they're going to chase them to Connecticut and kill them in a drive-in or whatever. <laughs> what I say, driving those things makes you insane in the head. <laughs> uh, Isabel Stewart Gardner created the Gardner Museum at Fenway Court, and her art 
impresario, her art connoisseur, Bernard Berenson, then fleeced all of Europe in order to find great artwork and stuff the place all the way up to the ceilings with artwork. Not every room, not every floor, people do still live at the Gardner Museum, and they certainly did when she was there. Uh, but it's an experience you have to see to believe. I believe that every major city has an art museum like the Gardner. They all have one like, for instance, Museum of Fine Arts here in Boston, which is virtually across the street from the Gardner, is the city's art museum, the big traditional art museum, right? The kind that you expect, the kind that has room after room after room and state-of-the-art climate control and all that sort of stuff. Every city has, every major city has something like that. The, the New York City has the Metropolitan Museum of Art, which is a life-changing experience. You can literally spend a lifetime in that building and never run out of wonder. But... New York City also has the Frick, which is very much a home. It feels like you're walking around in, in a home someone has filled with slightly illicit plunder. <laughs> and the same thing is true ten times over for the Gardner Museum. I always tell you, if you're coming to Boston to visit, the number one place you have to visit is Hyde Cottage. The number two place you have to visit is the sale lot of the Brattle Bookshop, but after that, the Gardner. Go to the Gardner before you go to the MFA if, the, if your time is pressing. Uh, and this is... Uh, Louisa Haltharp was a, a fantastic writer, and this is her biography of Isabella Stewart Gardner. It's called Mrs. Jack because her husband was Jack Gardner, a big, bluff, bear-like guy who adored her. Absolutely adored her. He knew perfectly well. In fact, because of, he was the one she drew her checks on, he knew better than anybody how impossible she was. He loved her anyway. The more impossibilities, the more he loved her. Every rumor, every outrageous story, only half of which were true. He would grumble and mutter, and then you get him in a deep chair on the first floor of the Boston Athenaeum, and it would you could just see it on his face. This is a man besotted. it. Uh, and the book is all about that. The book is all about that relationship. It's all about the beginning of the museum. It's all about her relationship with Berenson. It's just a fantastic story, full of color, because from early on, from age 19, she made herself a larger-than-life character. And I, th I think it's funny. I forget who does the introduction to this volume. Uh, who is it that does that? I maybe don't want to call them out because I might know them. Uh, oh, great. Okay. It's not signed. <laughs> the forward is not signed. And just as well, because the first line of the forward is Louisa Haltharp's Mrs. Jack is perhaps the most readable biography of Isabella Stewart Gardner. <laughs> There's no perhaps about that. It's one of the most readable biographies of an American by another American at any point in time. And I say that with a slight pang, because the other Isabella Stewart Gardner biography that you are likely to find at your library or bookstore was written by a friend of mine, Douglas Shantucci. And it is a very good book. But it's not as good as this. <laughs> as simple as that. I don't have to worry about him attacking me because he's not alive anymore. But it's not as good as this. This is just grand, old-style narrative nonfiction. And I thought, in honor of Nonfiction November, I would read you how it begins. There is Isabel Stewart Gardner. The Gardner Museum is set as a pathway along the center courtyard of Fenway Court. It is really only possible to move in one direction, up in a clockwise direction. Uh, you can drift all around, but you're, you're, you are naturally, the, the, the scope and shape of the building is naturally going to funnel you not only in one direction, but all the way to the top of the building. And at the top of the building, you will find this. You'll find herself, a portrait of herself. Uh, I want to read you the beginning of this, not the silly forward, but the the, uh, the opening that Lisa Haltharp wrote herself uh, when? A hundred years ago? No, 1965. Not a hundred years ago. <laughs> uh, I'll read you just a bit of it. It's a little long. I'll read you just a bit of it. Uh, the night was clear and cold, although snow had been forecast. A line of private carriages, with here and there a hired hack, circled a tall building standing solitary in partly reclaimed marshland. It, there's still marsh there. If you go, you will see. Uh, it was the evening of January 1st, 1903, and the brick building, referred to by the uninitiated as the Foyne Brewery, uh, was in fact a palace in the Venetian style, just completed in Fenway, Boston, Massachusetts. This was the first social occasion at Fenway Court, and the hour, at least as stated on the engraved invitations, was 9 o'clock punctually. 
As each carriage stopped at the palace door, gentlemen in top hats alighted to assist their ladies, who gathered long skirts in white-gloved hands, flickering carriage lamps shone on sealskin and sable. Diamonds flashed, half-hidden in the furs. There were delays. Ladies were kept standing in the cold at the palace door. A tall Italian majordomo, resplendent in green velvet, with gold braid, admitted guests two by two. The slow And slowly the carriages circled, each awaiting its turn until the hour was no longer nine punctually. Guests entered small rooms dimly lit by candles where they laid aside great coats and furs. There's still a small room right there as you go in where you lay aside your great coats and furs. A moment more and they stepped into the big room, dazzlingly white and brightly lighted with holophane lamps. Now the cause of the delay at the outer door became apparent. Everyone must take his place in line to climb a curving staircase, cross a landing, and then climb down again. And why would they have to do that? Because of who's on the landing. That's why. <laughs> on the landing, a small, slender woman stood alone, receiving her friends. She was gowned in sweeping black and wore her famous pearls, 149 of them. A great ruby glowed at her throat, and in her hair were two immense diamonds, the Raja and the Light of India. One over twelve carats, and the other more than twenty-five. The jewels had been the sensation of Boston, but they were eclipsed tonight by the building in which the guests were assembled. It was the future Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum, built for an art collection unique in the United States, and the lady at the top of the stairs was Mrs. Jack Gardner. Slowly the guests mounted here and there, a dowager puffing audibly. They were greeted by their hostess, and then they crossed the landing to descend an identical stand here, staircase, men shuffling their feet, Everyone waiting for the, sa the ambulance. I want to stress again, even though it will interrupt the reading, there is no emergency for those of you who are worried. The ambulance is running his lights because he doesn't want to wait in traffic. Uh, is that illegal in Massachusetts? It most certainly is. <laughs> anyway, uh, Mrs. Jack stood smiling, enjoying to the hilt the homage she was exacting. When the last guest went down the stairs to be seated in the small ballroom chairs below, Mrs. Gardner had a carved and gilded armchair brought forward on the landing. Here she sat and signaled to Wilhelm Garricky, the conductor of the Boston Symphony Orchestra. Fifty of his musicians had been tuning up on a platform at the far end of a huge music room. Now the concert could begin. And that is the scene. Everyone else down below, her sitting in basically a throne, high above them, looking down on the whole proceedings. <laughs> Isabel Stewart Gardner was a legend, even during her lifetime. Her infinite variety of resources and unique gyrations kept Boston, Beverly, and points east and west in a so state of social excitement, season after season. A Midwestern lady came east to see Mrs. Jack Gardner and the Atlantic Ocean, and was disappointed by neither. Yet Mrs. Gardner was far from beautiful, and she was only moderately wealthy during the area in which American millionaires flourished. Her charities were private and secret, her indiscretions all too often public, and publicized with little regard for the truth. She was called the Queen of Back Bay, but she had not always been a queen. And that's how this book starts, just off to a rollicking start. It just keeps going from there. Uh, it's fantastic. Absolutely fantastic, in other words. And I'm glad that Deb picked it for the beginning of Nonfiction November. I'm, I'm happy to reread it myself. So I thought I would read you a beginning of it, but I want to stress, we're not going to do this every day. <laughs> I'm not going to read to you for five hours every day. I, too, have enjoyed reading to you every day in place of talking about horrible Deep Space Nine novels. But honestly, people. Anyway, <laughs> I'm going to wrap this up for now. That is the beginning of Nonfiction November, uh, and I will see you soon. Thank you, book two.